Here's a diagram of the microscopic appearance of the adrenal gland, where this tissue above the black line, that's the adrenal capsule. That is um, encasement of fibrous connective tissue. And here we can see the difference between the adrenal cortex and the adrenal medulla. And so this is the adrenal medulla. So taking a look at the adrenal cortex, the adrenal cortex is made up of three regions. There's the zona glomerulosa, which is the most superficial region, the zona fasciculata, where the cells are arranged in kind of strand-like arrangements, and then the zona reticularis is the deepest layer of the adrenal cortex. In this video, we're going to talk about the hormones that come from the zona fasciculata. The zona fasciculata secretes a family of hormones called glucocorticoids. Cortisol is an example. Glucocorticoids work to regulate the metabolism of glucose. Taking a closer look at the regulation of cortisol secretion, the hypothalamus secretes a hormone called corticotropin-releasing hormone, or CRH. The hypothalamus releases CRH every morning as part of a circadian rhythm. It can also release increased amounts of CRH in times of stress. CRH circulates from the hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary, and it causes the anterior pituitary to release the hormone ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone. Adrenocorticotropic hormone primarily targets the zona fasciculata of the adrenal cortex, causing that region of the adrenal cortex to release cortisol. Cortisol primarily affects glucose metabolism, which is not the same thing as regulating blood glucose levels. Let me show you what I mean. Glucose metabolism deals with how the body utilizes glucose how, at the cellular level. So just as a brief overview, we know that we eat uh, three macronutrients, protein, carbohydrates, and fats. And after we ingest those in food, our GI tract uses enzymes to break down these macronutrients into the individual building blocks or monomers. For instance, protein would be broken down to amino acids. Carbohydrates are broken down into monosaccharides and fats into fatty acids. These individual building blocks or monomers enter into our blood. And from there, these nutrients enter into our cells. And this is where metabolism takes place, which is um, basically like a two-way street. When a nutrient enters into our cell, we can either use it uh, for energy or we could store it. And so under the effects of cortisol, cortisol has a glucose sparing effect. Glucose is a common monosaccharide. And by glucose sparing, what it means is it's going to not use it, it's going to spare it, it's going to store it for later. And so under the effects of cortisol, this is what we're saying happens, that glucose is going to be stored for later, and the storage form of glucose is glycogen. Now, as far as the other nutrients go, proteins get broken down into amino acids and fats into fatty acids, and under the effects of cortisol, uh, cortisol promotes use of those nutrients, and so amino acids that enter into our cell will get used uh, to make energy. Same thing with fatty acids. Fatty acids are going to be utilized, and not only will fatty acids and uh, amino acids be used preferentially above glucose under the effects of cortisol, we can actually use, the liver can use, amino acids and fatty acids to make new glucose, a process called gluconeogenesis. So the overall effects of cortisol is to not utilize glucose to save it for later. So you could see how that could affect blood glucose levels, but that's not the primary objective. The primary objective is to not utilize glucose to preferentially metabolize burn through amino acids and fatty acids.